Okay. <clears throat> praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we seek, we, we ask him for guidance and forgiveness. And we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and from the evil of our own actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom Allah makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due, and make sure you devote yourselves to him till your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion, and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome back. Uh, dear sisters and brothers, I'm grateful to Allah that um, we are able to uh, rejoin again on this blessed Friday. And so today I want to continue the story of Musa. I've done this the last uh, two times that I've been here. And so today will be part three. And so we're, we're going to just start off uh, where we left off last time. And then, of course, uh, inshallah, the goal is to then tie some relevance um, to the story of Musa into our current lives. There are so many lessons for us in the story of Musa, so many elements to contemplate upon. And as a reminder, I am uh, primarily sharing the story of Musa from both the Quran, in which I will indicate which chapter and verses that they're mainly in. In fact, I think today all of the verses are from Sultul Qasas, maybe one from another chapter. Um, but I will, I'll indicate which chapter and verses are being quoted. And then also my other source is... Um, there to, to sort of embellish the story. And I don't mean embellish in a negative way, but I mean offer more detail. And this source does corroborate uh, with numerous other stories of Prophet Musa that you may have heard or you, maybe you will hear. Um, but some of the details may vary, right? Um, but in general, the Quran gives us so much of Musa's story and the additional details, uh, they really just complement the story and kind of paint us more of a, a, a you know, colorful picture. Um. And of course, much of the details also come from previous groups of believers, right? Christians and, and Jews, of course. Jews. And Musa, Prophet Musa, Islam, was such a prominent figure within the Judaic faith, um, and it serves as a as a very vital prophet. Uh, what's interesting, I find, is uh, the details that are included in the Quran in the Quranic verses, either enhance or correct previous holy books. And you can call me bias, but I do find that the characters mentioned are more multidimensional in the Quranic text than they seem in, in the Bible. I'll also mention um, that there currently is a three-part docudrama film on Netflix called Testament, the story of Musa, story of Moses. And I actually heard about this from Dr. Selene Ibrahim, who some of you might remember joined us last Ramadan during the Halakha. She, she led the Halakha series. And she's one of the scholars included in the film. My only complaint with the film is that um, her perspective and voice isn't included more. Uh, but um, anyway, it's it's great. It's much more biblical, I think, than Quranic. But it's a definitely a good resource. And we talk about timing. Here we are going through his story. And then Netflix just kind of lobs one over to us. But anyway, so we're going to continue where we left off. And if you recall last time, Musa had just fled to Egypt after wrongfully and unintentionally killing an Egyptian, the, author the authorities were after him. So he quickly and abruptly left the city and headed across the desert with only the clothes on his back. And so after walking for, for more than a week across the burning desert, Musa arrived uh, at an oasis where groups of men were watering their animals. So maybe they were pushing, fighting, joking, laughing, behaving in a rough and tumble manner. Or maybe, you know, they were just sort of... Um, uh, you know, kind of oh, they had overtaken the water hole and, and didn't leave any room. But Musa notices um, that there are two women who are set back who wanted to water their sheep, but they were un they were unable to. Um, and they were very hesitant to approach this water hole. And so Musa, of course, just despite being, can you even imagine how incredibly exhausted? He is still a man of honor. And he could see that the women were standing back and they were somewhat um, timid or afraid to move toward the water hole for a number of reasons, as I mentioned. So he approached them, asked why the men in their family did not look after the sheep. And they, the two women expressed that their father was an old man and the task of caring for the sheep was now their responsibility. 
So Musa took the women's sheep to the waterhole where he easily pushed among, among the men that were already there. And after completing the task, Musa's energy was totally spent. He sat under the shade of the tree and began to supplicate God. He said, O oh Lord, whatever good you can bestow on me, I am surely in need of it. So again, this is what the Quran says, quote, as he made his way towards Midian, he was saying, my Lord, may my Lord guide me to the right way. When he arrived to Midian's water, he found a group of men watering their flocks and beside them, two women keeping their flocks back. So he said, what is the matter with you two? They said, we cannot water our flocks until the shepherds take their sheep away. Our father is a very old man. He watered their flocks for them, withdrew for, into the shade and prayed, my Lord, I am in dire need of whatever good you may send me. So that, that's verses 22 through 24, the 28th chapter. And where is Midian? So according to both the biblical and Islamic understanding, it is believed to be on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba in, in western present day, northwestern present day Saudi Arabia. So you can imagine the route Musa would have taken to get from Egypt, you know, go across the entirety of the Sinai Peninsula all the way to Midian. And again, can you imagine no matter what time of the year, just in that distance, in that in that environment, how exhausted he would be. And the Quran, you know, relates to us the stories of the prophets of God in order that we might learn from them. Prophets are worthy role models and their lives are not so different from our own, except for the prophethood. How many times have we felt, you know, so physically or mentally exhausted that it seems we would be unable to go on for a second? How many times has any of us sunk into the ground or into a chair in despair? So Musa, again, turned to the only real source of help for humankind, that's being God. Uh, and before his supplication was, was finished, help was on, the, on its way. Musa was probably hoping for a slice of bread or a handful of dates, but instead, God gave him safety, provisions, and a family. So one of the two women returned to Musa. She conducted herself with modesty and shyness, and she said to Musa, my father wants to reward you for your kindness and invites you to our home. Consequently, Musa roused himself and went to see the elderly man. They sat together and Musa relayed, uh, related his story. The elderly man allayed his fears and told Musa that he had safely crossed the Egyptian border. He was now in Midian and was safe from any authorities that may have been pursuing him. Again, we continue with the 25th verse of the chapter, chapter 28 from the Quran. And then one of the two women approached him walking shyly and said, my father is asking for you. He wants to reward you for watering our flock for us. When Musa came to him and told him his story, the old man said, do not be afraid. You are safe now from the people who do wrong. So after Musa had been invited to stay with the family, one of the women approached her father and privately advised him to hire Musa. When her father asked why, she answered, because he is strong and trustworthy. These are two qualities that Islam tells us are signs of leadership. In the years immediately following the death of the Prophet, for instance, peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad, uh, may the, um, the leaders of the Muslim nation were chosen for these two qualities. They learned their politics from the Quran, from the stories of the righteous predecessors, you know, and, and, and may we always go back to these stories to determine which virtues to uplift in leadership, which virtues to seek out in leadership. So again, going back to these two women. So notice that it's the women themselves who see Musa, who see in Musa something special because they accept his way. They accept his help. They recognized in him these qualities of strength and trustworthiness. They elevate the importance of these attributes to their father and advocate on behalf of Musa. So the Quran lays this out for us in, in the next three verses, 26, 27, and 28. One of the women said, father, hire him. A strong, trustworthy man is the best to hire. The father said, I would like to marry you to one of, I, I, sorry, I'm back up. The father said to Musa, I would like to marry you to one of these daughters of mine on condition that you serve me for eight years. If you complete 10, it will be of your own free will. I do not intend to make things difficult for you. God willing, you will find I am a fair man. Musa responded and said, 
Let that be the agreement between us. Whichever of the two terms I fulfill, let there be no injustice to me. God is witness for what we say. Okay, again, so let's look at Sass, verses 26 through 28. The elderly man, who some scholars believe was Prophet Shuel, although there are no authentic sources either confirming or denying this, he offers Musa the safety and security of his own family. He gave one of his daughters in marriage to Musa on the condition that he work for eight years or 10 if Musa agreed to stay on for the further two years. Musa was a stranger in a strange land, exhausted and alone, but God heard his supplication and provided for him from sources that Musa could never have imagined. As believers, we must never forget that God hears our supplications and answers. Sometimes the wisdom behind the answers is beyond our comprehension, but God only desires, but God desires only good from us, good for us. Putting our trust in God and submitting to his will will allow the believer to weather any storm and to stand tall in the face of adversity. We are never alone, just as Musa was not alone as he trudged across the desert, fleeing the only life and land he had ever known. So we'll stop at, at the story of Musa right here. And then I want to um, continue on and pull out some of these little tidbits of lessons that we can hopefully derive from this, this part of the story. <clears throat> I could look over how those for Allah. I say this, uh, I say the saying of mine, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulullah. In the name of God, in exalt and exaltations be to Allah. The blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. Okay, so how is the story of Musa relevant in our lives today? What lessons can we take away from these verses in the Quran? So I want to focus on two things. One, I want to uplift um, the, the numerous virtues that Allah has pointed out just in this segment of the story, right? So we start off Musa approaches the watering hole and he recognizes that there is an imbalance here. You have men who have overtaken the watering hole who are preventing women from watering their flock. Okay. So what Musa exudes right here is, in my opinion, the epitome of chivalry. He uses what he has, right? Not to boast, not to kill, not to, you know, kind of flex for the sake of flexing. But he uses his strength, his male presence, his his maleness to take the sheep and get them watered for no reason other than recognizing that they are unable to do so based on, you know, it being two women who are shy, too shy to approach and sort of push their way through. So we have chivalry. We have another virtue is, uh, is Musa in having that pure trust in Allah. Here he is fleeing, going across this desert. Um, and if you've ever seen the Sinai, you can imagine just how how kind of barren um, it is. There's a reason why not a lot of people live in the Sinai. Um, but, but Musa puts his trust in Allah. At the moment of that deep despair, he puts his trust in Allah. He turns to Allah for help. Okay. Another virtue is that shyness that the that the Quran mentions that the daughter had when she approached Musa, um, but yet she approached. She didn't say, hey, man, who are you? You know, what are you doing? Hey, you know, my daddy wants to come. No, no, she approaches him. Allah points out that shyness, that that humility that she carried with him, with her. Um, and she invites him, but yet she is the one. She doesn't, the father doesn't go out, doesn't send some some village boy. She He still sends, the father still sends the daughter to retrieve Musa and invite her to the home, that conduct. How do we conduct ourselves um, amongst one another um, is something that's pointed out in the Quran. Of course, we have the virtue of hospitality. You know, the father inviting Musa, who is a total stranger. Yes, the guy did a good job. He watered the sheep, but I don't, you know, he doesn't know him from Adam, right? And here he is inviting him to his home. Protection. Uh, the father assuring Musa after hearing his story and believing his story, right? That he assures Musa, you are safe, you are from you are far from the wrongdoing people. 
trust. Here is the father trusting Musa, trusting that his story is the truth. What did he see in Musa where he totally believed this is this man is telling the truth? How often do we see this in people, in complete strangers? Um, another virtue is advocacy, right? The daughter speaking up um, to her dad about the potential of hiring Musa. She's advocating for Musa, for a stranger, right? Musa, alternatively, again, going back to the chivalry, advocating for these women, you know, kind of pointing out, hey, some stranger has to come and take these sheep to get them watered because you men are not paying attention. He's advocating for them. And of course, the two attributes that are mentioned clearly in the in the verses are strength and trustworthiness. As I mentioned earlier, those are two virtues that that the Quran highlights as um, elements of, of leadership. Another virtue is fairness, right? When, excuse me, when the father reaches the deal, makes the deal, extends the deal to Musa, he does so openly and clearly with fairness. And then making that contract so public, laying out the terms, <laughs> excuse me, if you do this for this many years, this is what you will have. You know, I'll give you protection. I'll give you a home to stay. I need you to work for me. You can marry my daughter. You'll be treated as family, accepting as family. And these contracts are based on equality and justice, right? Musa asks not to be treated in an unjust manner. The father promises not to treat him in an unjust manner. You know, these are these are things that, that we have to recognize our virtues in the Quran for all of us. We can take these virtues. We can uplift these virtues in our own lives, right? We should be aspiring to engage these virtues into our everyday lives. And how can we do that, right? I started off, the title of this talk is a Stranger in a Strange Land. And that's actually a verse from the Bible that we would see in the next next part of this story um, where Musa views himself as a stranger in a strange land or a foreigner or foreigner foreign land how are we doing how are we behaving to the stranger and by strangers it could be anyone it could be a new neighbor it could be an immigrant it could be a refugee it could be a new Muslim right think of all the new Muslims that we um that we meet how are we treating them? Are we trusting them? Oh, excuse me. Are we advocating for them? Are we protecting them? Are we extending hospitality to them? And I mean hospitality more than just, oh, you converted. We're going to throw you a big party. You're a Muslim. Here's some gifts. And then we never talk to you again, right? We don't include you. We don't think of you. We don't think of you the struggles. Do we really think about it? And I'm saying this as a reminder to myself, first and foremost, you know, we look at people who are different, who are new, who aren't quite in the in crowd, okay? Whether again, it be immigrants or refugees or new neighbors or Muslims or whatever it may be. You know, do we look at them and go, oh, what's their story? What are they up to? You know, what I'm trying to figure them out, I'm gonna crack that code until I really trust them. This story negates all of those habits that we engage in and instead replaces it with a better way to treat people a better way to be a community, to grow a community, to strengthen a community. And so, um, as you see, my throat is uh, giving me a hard time. So I will wrap it up here. But again, I think that this gives us some food for thought, right? And how can we just be better people, better community members, better strain, better people to the strangers, because you never know at one time we could be that stranger. Maybe we have been that stranger. Maybe we have been that foreigner, that immigrant, that refugee, that new Muslim. And now we're in the in crowd. We're in the dominant crowd. We're in that, you know, we have that safety and protection. Um, and, and we cannot forget where we come from. And we cannot forget where we're going. Any one of us could, we, you know, we could have been a stranger. We could be a stranger one day. And how would we want to be treated? And so with that, I will conclude uh, my talk, and uh, we'll just say some dua. So, O oh Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions and forgive us our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to experience many more moments together. Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire.
Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenges we may face. Allah, I ask you to place peace and solace in the hearts of those who are suffering any injustices and give us those, give those of us who have the power to suppress and reject and push back uh, injustices. Oh Allah, make us a community who treats the stranger with dignity, respect, and acceptance. Oh Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. And if I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression.